Yeah, be praying if you never been baptized, be praying about that, or if you have been baptized and you didn't really know what it meant. <laughs> um, you can never you can never do it too many times. I know that sometimes it, that's a question people ask. If I've been baptized before, can I can I do it again and again and again? <laughs> There's nothing against that, but the main thing is to understand what it is symbolizing. I'm blessed that my eight-year-old boy, Josh, was getting baptized today, so that's going to be a blessing. And if you see him, ask him, hey, what, what's baptism all about? You know, and then report back to me. <laughs> but um, Numbers chapter 34 for our study this morning. Um, well, Numbers... And remember chapter 33 last week, just for some review, uh, basically to destroy the idols, demolish the idols. Um, and the, the scripture that really jumped out for me was uh, verse 55 of near the end there of uh, Numbers 33, 55. If you do not drive out or will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it will come to pass that those which you let remain in the uh, of them shall be pricks in your eyes or thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it will come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. And what we actually learn from that is the children of Israel never did kick out everyone in that land like they were told to do. <laughs> they never did drive out completely. And so twice from the Assyrians and from the Babylonians, twice they were hauled off. They were driven out, if you will, of the land. And so thinking that somehow... Uh, well, we don't need to be so harsh. And, and actually, as we get to the book of Joshua, that comes up. People think it's really harsh and the Lord's being really angry. Um, he needs to show more grace. <laughs> and people read the Old Testament sometime like that. And really, you cannot call grace, and this is a good quote, <laughs> don't call it grace when you're letting sin remain. Do not call that grace. That is not grace. When you let and allow sin to remain. That is not grace. That's a skewed view of grace. And so what God is calling them to do here is His will. <laughs> He's calling them to be His flood. His fire. Because in times of old, in Genesis 6, He took care of it by a flood. He got rid of the inhabitants by a flood. And he did it in Sodom and Gomorrah by a fire. This time he just happens to be using people to do it. And wouldn't you know it, it didn't quite do the job. <laughs> and so we have this, we as humans have this thing called emotions that can run us and sometimes it ruins us. And so don't let your emotions get the best of you. Um, and keep that in mind, because these guys really do. The Canaanites become a thorn in their side and a real irritant in their eye. <laughs> and we talked about that. And so you want to do what the Lord is calling you to do and follow through. Do it completely. But verse uh, chapter 34 now. Oh, and I meant to make the correlation because... I'm not saying to go downtown Santa Rosa and start driving everyone out with a literal whip in your hand and kind of just, you know, I got to demolish all these idols. And, no. Colossians chapter 1, it's always good for us to see the New Testament uh, view, if you will, of how this speaks to you and I, that is, spiritually. 
in our lives. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. And set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead. Your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also will appear with him in glory. Here it is. So mortify, or crucify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That is, and he, he goes through, and in, in, this is Colossians 3, verse 5 now. Fornication, uncleanness, in, inordinate affection, evil, uh, covetous, idolatry. So get rid of that stuff. In the same way, back in Numbers chapter 33, the end of the chapter there, God's telling them to get rid of that stuff. And for them, it was literal idols, not just idolatry. In our, in our day, uh, it's idolatry. <laughs> and it's all around us in many different forms. But verse 1 of Numbers 34, somebody say, praise God, he's starting to read, okay. <laughs> just catching us up. But Numbers chapter 34, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that will fall unto you for an inheritance, even the land of Canaan between or with the coasts thereof. Or, in other translations, these are the boundaries that they're going to be. Verse 3, Your south quarter shall be from the wet wilderness of Zen along by the coast of Edom, and your south border shall be the uttermost or utmost coast of the salt sea or the dead sea eastward. And your border shall turn from the south to the ascent of Akrabim, and uh, thereof shall be from the south of Kadesh Barnea, and shall go on to Hazar, uh, Hazar Adder, and pass on to Asmon. And the border shall fetch a compass from Asmon unto the river of Egypt, and the goings out of it shall be to the Dead Sea. And as for the western border, ye shall even have the great sea for a border. This shall be your west border. Verse 7. And this shall be your north border from the great sea, or the Mediterranean Sea. Ye shall point out for you Mount Hor, that is a different Mount Hor, by the way, than the one that Aaron died on. And this is a different Mount Hor. From verse 8, Mount Hor, ye shall point out your border unto the entrance of Hamath, and the goings forth of the border shall be to Zadad. And the border shall go on to Ziphron, and, and the goings out of it shall be at Hazaran. Hazaran and uh, this shall be your north border, and ye shall point out your east border from uh, Hazarenim to Shepham. Verse 11, And the coast shall go down from Shepham to Ribla on the east side of Aden. And the border shall descend and shall reach unto the side of the sea of Chinnereth eastward. And the border shall go down to Jordan and the goings out of it shall be at the salt sea. This shall be your land with the coast thereof round about. So, verse 1 through 12, as we just read, is kind of bordering off or putting sheep pens, is what they would use, literally use, um, to, to kind of have it, the, the property end line, right? And so you had a southern border, border which is, became known as the Negev, N-E-G-E-V, right? The Negev, and the, that is uh, verses 3 through 5, as we read. And that's the southern border. And then you had the western border, which was basically the Mediter Mediterranean Sea, which you, was used as the western border. That's verse 6. And then verse 7 through 9 was the northern border we looked at. And we mentioned that that's a different Mount Hor than the one that Aaron died on. Um, but so you had the southern border, the western border, 
verse 7 through 9 was the northern border, and then verse 10 through 12, as we just read, was the eastern border, and that basically is the Dead Sea, or as it's called here, the Salt Sea. Um, but the whole uh, concept, <laughs> the whole question really becomes, why borders? Why boundaries? Just let them continue to voyage and journey and, you know, go out into all the world and adventure. That, that would be what my eight-year-old would ask me. Why do I have to stop at the, the street? Why borders? Why is there a stop sign? Why is there a mark that I can't go? It's actually what the ocean is asking God every day. Why can't we just keep coming in and coming in? God actually stops the ocean from going beyond that border. Why borders? Why boundaries? I almost titled the message, Borders and Boundaries. Because that's really what this chapter is about, this first part. Why can't the neighbor's yard be part of my property? Well, God is the one that puts these boundaries in place. God is the one who looks at us as his children. God is truly our Heavenly Father. Looking down on us, seeing this is dangerous. This area is not good for you. This is not good for anyone. Stop. <laughs> Don't go there. And what we're going to learn, actually, what's in incredible, is that the children of Israel only take about a sliver of this land. A sliver. <laughs> I mean, to this day. And these borders that are spoken here, this is an important chapter, by the way, because for thousands of years, this area has been fought over. Wars and wars. And everyone has, and, and just these, these specific areas in Genesis 34 that we just read, they're, they're just, they've been the uh, cause of so many wars. That continue to this day. And so it's, it's incredible. And Israel has never been as big as God meant it to be. And uh, remember, um, here's another review. Verse 13 through 15. This will take us back to those two and a half tribes. <laughs> that we're not all in. Uh, verse 13 goes on. Moses, Moses commanded the children of Israel saying... This is the land which you will inherit by lot, which the Lord commanded to give unto the nine tribes and to the half tribes. Now what happened to the twelve, right? Well, for the tribe, the, verse 14, of the children of Reuben, according to the house of their fathers, and the tribe of the children of Gad, according to their house, uh, the house of their fathers, have received their inheritance, and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance. The two tribes and half tribe have received their inheritance on this side near Jericho, eastward toward the sun rising, or on that side, on the other side of the Jordan. We're going to see what a big deal it was for these guys to cross that river, Jordan. Once again, once we get to uh, the book of Joshua, we're going to see that. This was huge for the rest, for the nine and a half tribes to cross over the River Jordan. It, it would make a lot of sense. If you were there, <laughs> you'd be probably with Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. Because sight would tell you, logic would tell you, you're crazy. We're not crossing over that. But God promised it. God said in His Word, I don't care. <laughs> like so many today, God says plainly in His Word so many things. And it's questioned over and over. In fact, that's the enemy's design from the start. Did God really say? That can't be all there is. Did God really mean what He said when He said don't eat of the fruit? Yes, 
what, what is in His Word. Thank God we have His Word. Because otherwise you would have the opinions of men, the opinions of humans, which will leave you confused, by the way. Putting it up to a vote <laughs> to see what's right and what's not. Are you kidding me? Let the majority decide <laughs> and you end up with a society like we have. Where everything's backwards. In fact, we're going to get to, not too long, we'll get to the book of Judges. We're told what happens in the book of Judges and quite a few times actually. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They all went to Disneyland and they followed the rules. Do what makes you happy. Follow your dreams. Right? <laughs> Whatever, if it feels good, do it. And in the book of Judges, I'll, I'll just warn you, if you've never read it, the Bible is R-rated. You know when you get to the book of Judges. If you thought numbers was graphic, if you thought the stuff that we, and we have looked at some pretty gnarly stuff, in numbers even, but you get to Judges and you've got some very fascinating stuff. And it's, it's, uh, it's not so many names of places like we have here. Um, but being reminded of these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, being half-hearted, not all in, not too sure about that, just kind of dipping my toe in. <laughs> and then, remember, Moses told him, your sin will find you out. You better be in it when it comes time to fight, when it comes time to battle. And it's amazing that the Lord allows them to do it. But they get so ripped off, as we mentioned when we were there a uh, few chapters back. I think that was uh, Numbers 32. But that whole story of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh being uh, held back by what they saw. <laughs> being held back, really, in, in that Scripture's perfect. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's, hard. it's easy to say that, easy to read that, but start stepping out into it, it's a different story. <laughs> so that, it's a, verse 13 through 15, as we read, is just a reminding that they have their inheritance. They've chosen their place on that side of the Jordan. They're not going in any further. They're good with where they're at. And I hope, I hope that each and every one of us here today are not okay with where we're at. I really do hope that we want to move forward, that we want to press on, that we want to learn more. I don't know near enough about Jesus Christ and this book. <laughs> oh, and neither do you, by the way. <laughs> I'm not alone in this. And I don't care how many PhDs anyone has, how many letters or numbers they have after their name, right? No, it, all of us only scratch, I mean, you read Genesis through all the way through to Revelation, you just scratch the surface. How many of you read Genesis all the way through to Revelation? None of us. That's good. But even if you did that, you just scratch the surface of the mind of God, the heart of God. And what are we busy listening to? What are we busy studying? Things that can only benefit me. Put money in my account. Benefit my family, my kids, my grandkids. And we spend all our time, all our, even our money, our effort, we spend it on things that pertain, just as we read earlier in Colossians chapter 3, that whole section. Read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, or jot that down for a homework assignment later. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. Get the mind of Christ. Get your mind on things above. Aren't you tired of the news? Aren't you tired of hearing gossip everywhere you go? Of seeing the tabloids? Of seeing the, the uh, headlines? Especially this month, by the way. 
Pride month. And that doesn't pick on any certain group. Pride is ugly. No matter what it is. Pride, if I have pride in myself, that's what pride is. That's ugly. That's the last thing anyone needs. More pride. In fact, that's how you get kicked out of heaven. It's true. Isaiah 14 is pretty clear. In fact, there's five I wills of an angel called Lucifer. Five I wills of Lucifer. Another good homework assignment. Isaiah 14. Why did Lucifer fall from heaven? Pride. This very issue that's, that's flaunting itself. Set my affection, set my mind, as Colossians 3 says, on things above, not on things <laughs> here. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Don't be looking at the earth as your home, but look for a building and a maker that's, that, that, a city that has a builder and a maker that's God, like Abraham did. Not looking for some physical, material thing, but looking for the Lord, ultimately. Well, the inheritance is divvied up at the end of, the, we'll finish out the chapter here. Numbers 34, verse 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, These are the names of the young of the men which shall divide the land unto you, Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun. You shall take one prince of every tribe to divide the land by inheritance. Verse 19. The name of the men are these, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the tribe of the children of Simeon, Shemuel, the son of Amihud, of the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad, the son of Chislon, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Dan, Buki, the son of Jogli. There's some good names for you guys there. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, verse 23, the prince of the children of Joseph, uh, for the tribe of the children of Manasseh, Haniel, the son of Ephod, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Ephraim, Kemuel, the son of Shiftan, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Zebulun, uh, Elizaphan, the son of Parnach, uh, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Issachar, Pal Paltiel, the son of Azan, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Asher, Ahi Ahihud, the son of Shalomoi, Shalomi, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Naphtali, uh, Pedal, and this, uh, the son of Amihud. These are they whom the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance unto the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. Again, this last little part here reminds us of how much our Heavenly Father really looks out for His kids. For his people. It's, it's, our God is a God of order. Our God is always looking out for his children. In fact, God knew. God knew there would be confusion, <laughs> chaos, pain, and all of those things. And he sets leaders in place. He sets authority in place. In fact, Romans chapter 13 let you and I know every authority that is set in place is there and set there by God. I don't like that verse either. Because that means the police officer, the judge that's on the stand, the governor, the president, they're put there by God. Now we all have a really hard time with this, don't we? but we're to submit to the authority that's put into place. Now, there is a time in the book of Acts, you can see it, where Paul, Paul and Peter, who are put, being put in prison, are told, never speak the name of Jesus again. You can talk about Buddha all you want. You can talk about all these other gods all you want. And Caesar, man, that's to be everyone's God in their day. But they were forbidden. And Peter said, 
we will do what God says to do and not what you say to do. So when it comes to that point, you're allowed to rebel against the authority, if you will. If you're being put in prison for speaking the name of Jesus. So live your life, but <laughs> submit to the authorities. And God is placing these leaders in the tr of each tribe. It's also a reminder how the man, the husband, the father is to be the leader in the home. He's to set the tone. He's to set the pace, the rhythm for the family. It's so incredibly sad, the lack of leadership in houses and homes, in marriages. Kids that are in prison because dad was never around. They never knew their dad. I mean, the, the, uh, it, it's off the charts, the amount of just those facts. Not now, Rebecca. Okay, I guess. Mama's good. But really, as, as uh, Matt was praying, that God would show us how to be men that would lead our wives, that would lead our children, that would lead our homes, showing them. Someone says it's too late. No, because I don't have grandkids yet. And if you're saying it's too late, you probably have grandkids. It's never too late to start being that example, start walking that walk so that they can look at grandpa, grandma, and say, that's what I want to be like. That's what I tell my kids. Look at grandpa and grandma. Don't look at me. No. That's not. <laughs> but, but really, ultimately, teaching, as we should all be, teaching each other to look to God. Amen? Keep my eyes on God. That's a whole other study for a whole other day is people getting their eyes on humans. And God knew that too. We get our eyes on our Father on earth. We get our eyes on our mom or our grandpa or our uncle that did all kinds of horrible things. And all of a sudden we lose sight. We, we in fact say There's, there is no God. And, and we do, we, we put so much on humans, why? Because we can see them, we can hear them, they can hurt us. And in most cases they hurt us more than they help us. <laughs> and we get our eyes off of God. It's why a lot of people don't go to church, by the way. They say those people at that church, such hypocrites. And as my dad has pointed out, I bet you never met a hip hypocrite in a bar, huh? <laughs> no. We don't come to church. I hope you don't come to church so that you see another human and get really excited. That would be depressing. We go to church, I hope, to glorify and to look and to behold what manner of love the Father has lavished, the Word is, just totally given unto us. That you, that me, we could be called sons, daughters of God. I mean, we, we sing the, that song and it's a great, and it's First John chapter 3, if you haven't read it. 1 John chapter 3. It's ver verbatim. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us. Don't look at your, your earthly father. Don't look at your earthly example. Look to, you, to the heavenly Father. And this, it really, God has, has had provision over all mankind for centuries 
knowing there would be earthly fathers that were terrible. Knowing that this would happen and that Father's Day would come around and for some, it's the hardest day of the year. Just like we mentioned, and I think I mentioned it on Mother's Day. It's always some, some tragedy. It's always going to be harder for some. But if I understand, just as the title of the message says, that He is our Heavenly Father. I know we can't see Him. I know we don't hear Him verbally. But He is, just as He said before Abraham was, I am. He is. And He will ever be our Heavenly Father. And, and He doesn't disappoint. He doesn't make promises to His kids and then not show up. Like I do. Like maybe you've done. He doesn't do the things that your father did that was such a poor example and such a hard thing to look at. Some can't even get past that. They really don't. This is why God is the great healer. He heals you psychologically. He heals you physically, mentally. All of the healing is there. He's the perfect father. And he's our heavenly father. The borders, the boundaries. He sets these things and these leaders at the end of the chapter. He sets these people and these things in place. Why? Just to bum you out? Just so you wouldn't have any fun? No. Because He loves you. He loves me. He's not doing this to you to make you... In fact, Proverbs... I, I promised I would read this today. It's Father's Day, so. Why are fathers so important? And mothers. But especially in Proverbs here. 29. I love this, the way it's written. Proverbs 29, verse 15. This is going to be uh, uh, controversial, just so you know. Proverbs 29, 15. That's why I love it. And I, it's also why I almost didn't read it. The rod. You guys ever had a spanking stick? You guys know what that is? Okay. The rod and reproof or correction gives wisdom. And here's what you can highlight as a dad, as a parent. But a child left to themselves brings shame to its mother. There's something in that. <laughs> Dad, it's your job to discipline, to correct, because that child can bring shame to its mother. In that verse, it's pointed, it's, it's directed towards fathers. Do well for your wife, that child's mother. Don't leave that child to itself. Just as God could not leave the children of Israel to themselves. They bring shame. They're a disgrace. You see what happens. And we'll, like I said, in the book of Judges, and you know, when you're out in public and you see some, some of these kids and, and People that have been raised, they've just been left to themselves. Don't get mad at them that their pants are falling down. They've been left to themselves. It's a disgrace. It's shameful. But don't contribute to that. Don't write that off. Understand, that's, there's a reason for that. And there, there's a reason for fathers. Our Heavenly Father will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Why? Because He wants to be glorified. <laughs> and He deserves all glory. And when we under the sooner we understand that, the sooner we come to just worship Him, to give Him the glory, and say, Lord, I just want, I'm glad to be your son. 
I'm glad to be your kid. <laughs> and say, thank you, God. And we do thank you, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. For these fathers that are here today, we thank you for the children that are here today, Lord. Again, we lift them up. And for those getting baptized, Lord, we lift them up and pray that today would especially become special um, in the sight of, of you, ultimately. And Lord, you're the only one that can make something special, truly. So we just give this day to you. We honor our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. Amen.